Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of your Columbus Urban League Minority Business Assistance Center uh, curriculum on education and training for entrepreneurs. I am very excited and very pleased to bring you today's speaker. You know, there's a saying out there, when the student is ready, the master appears. And I have so much anticipation on the information that's gonna be shared with us today by Deona Barnett, um, whom you have probably known working in this space for quite some time. Not only is she a strategist um, and a consultant and entrepreneurship educator, she is also a success story in terms of someone that moved into uh, working for herself uh, in the past, I believe, two to three years. So who better can we learn from than somebody that has went through this process um, and becoming a successful business owner? And as we celebrate Women's History Month, I just want to tip my hat to Diona for the success that she's achieved so far and look forward to how she's going to help us also on our path to success. Diona, you want to go ahead and turn your camera on so we can see your beautiful face? Hello, there you are. Okay, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Okay, great, welcome. Well, um, one of the things that I love is that she's succinct and to the point. When I looked over her LinkedIn and her bio information, again, I was just so impressed with her experience, her expertise, her education in this ecosystem. Um, and she's gonna bring us some great information, but you know, what I love most is what she said on her LinkedIn profile is to do what is right and not what is easy. So make it hard for us, Diona, show us what we need to do. And I'm gonna go ahead and mute and turn off my screen and let you take over the show. All right, well, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share my presentation for today. Let's see here. All right. Uh, so again, thank you for joining today. Today is Marketing 101. Refresh your message. My name is Deanna Barnett and I am the CEO and Managing Consultant of Eventy Enterprises. I want to go ahead and start with giving you an introduction about myself and my company. I have 12 years experience in small business development. I've trained over 1,500 entrepreneurs in my tenure, uh, specializing in business planning, financial management, and community organizing. I am a graduate of the Fisher College of Business at The Ohio State University, specializing in marketing. I'm also a former nonprofit executive in the small business development space. And lastly, and most important, I am a mother of four, four boys, a wife, and I'm also a musician. A little bit about Avinci Enterprises. I started this company a couple years ago um, to further assist small businesses in education and operations. We focus on strategy and planning, preparation for financing, government contracting, and outreach. Our clients expand from... Um, Oh, excuse me. Our clients expand from <clears throat> middle market to main street. Uh, we are startups and emerging CEOs. And uh, we have trained um, over 200 individuals since we started just a couple years ago. And my assistant has joined us. Her name is Sharonda Barnett. Sharonda, I'm gonna have you exit the uh, webinar and join from the link that we provided to you. All right, so our stats. So we, on average, we train about 150 on entrepreneurs annually. Uh, we have over $10 million in client, rep in client revenues and we, our um, approving diversity certification. So NBE, WBE, DBE, very much so certifications that you see from the MBAC. We have 100% approval rate. What we do is we uh, do the application for our small businesses who are very busy. And we have supported over $700,000 in funding last year, mostly due to COVID relief funding. Um, however, we do support other working capital resources. 
So today we're going to uh, work on crafting our message, but first we have to define our proper our value proposition. That is the most important component of crafting your message. We will then have to identify who our real customers are, uh, who wants that value, and then we'll start crafting our winning message for today. So what you might need for today is notebook, paper, uh, pen and pencil, and post-it notes. This is optional, but it helps with the design uh, process and your creativity and really putting things together. So um, if you don't already have those things, go ahead and take a quick moment to grab something to write with because I have a lot to share and I want you to start thinking about how the information that I share with you applies to your business. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with defining your value proposition. This is the real reason why customers come to you. So you can have the uh, best product or service in the world, but if you cannot communicate your value proposition, uh, people are most likely not going to purchase from you. So we need to understand what is our value proposition. A value proposition is a clear statement about the tangible results customers get from using your products or services and uh, the solutions that you offer. So your products and services could help uh, solve a problem, uh, satisfy a need, or make life easier in some way, fashion, or form. So these are some questions that you should ask yourself when defining your value proposition. And that value proposition is the essence of your total business model, how your company operates and makes money. The, the decisions that you make, the people that you interact with, they are all based on the value you are trying to give your customers. So in defining your value proposition, ask yourself, what problem are you solving? And believe it or not, uh, you are in business to solve a problem. Yes, you're in business to make money, but you are solving a problem for someone. And so some business owners say to me, well, I'm, I'm not really not, I'm really not solving a problem. And I would challenge them and say, think again about that. And I like to give the example of uh, the water bottle. When the water bottle first came out in the early '90s, uh, it was a big, uh, it was a big issue and concern because the question was, who is going to pay for bottled water? And the reason why that was a question is because at the time, water was free, so they were thinking who's going to pay for bottled water? This idea is crazy. This is absurd. Why would people buy bottled water? And so uh, the makers of bottled, bottled water had to identify the problems that bottled water could solve. So some of those problems could be uh, in a disaster or a natural disaster when clean water is not um, easily accessible, bottled water could be stored and then provided to people um, in need of clean water. Then there was the issue of the tap water not being clean and uh, how, it, how it was affecting your body and how well your body could function if you had cleaner water. So if you can remember when bottled water first came out, there was hype about how the bottled water was filtrated or how it came from uh, the springs of some mountains far north and how clean the water is. And uh, they really, really uh, drive home the cleanliness of this water and how it makes your body function better. Uh, so there were multiple reasons. Another reason about the, uh, another value that the bottled water provided was clean on the go water. So if you are out somewhere, don't want to drink from a water fountain, grab a bottle, fresh, clean bottle water from the vending machine and, and uh, avoid the dirty water. So Think about what problem you are solving in your business. What are you, um, what additional benefit are you providing your customers as a result of them buying your product or service? Are you satisfying a need for them? Do they, what do they need that you are offering? How are you making life easier? Why should customers buy from you is the number one question. So here are some types of value propositions that you can uh, consider. And when we say value propositions, we're not asking what, what you are, like what product it is and what service it is. We're saying, what is the benefit of that product or service? So are you offering something faster? 
are you offering something that's more convenient for the customer or it's easier to use? Are you offering something at a lower price or something that is free for the customers? Are you offering some sort of risk reduction? So a risk reduction, a great example of that would be insurance companies. Uh, they don't actually have a product or service that they are selling and nothing tangible. What they are providing is a assurance that they will reduce the risk of your liability in case something bad happens. They will help cover damages so that that full liability will not be on you. So that's reducing risk. Um, are you offering something that's just new to the market, uh, never before seen? Are you offering something that's going to improve performance of something uh, or someone uh, to make work better? Are you customizing something that customers can't get anywhere else that is suitable just for them? Customization. Are you just getting the job done for them? Are you doing the work? Are you making it work better? Are um, all of these things are value propositions, things that make life easier or benefit the customer? Are you offering appealing design, uh, something that the customer is looking for that they can't find anywhere else? Better technology. Uh, you see appealing design and better technology a lot with uh, cell phones and how there's a new phone every year. It's like, how can they make a new phone every year? Uh, but they are looking at what their customers um, value. They are valuing it the way that their phone looks. So we can change this up a little bit. We're, we're just gonna change one thing and create a whole new phone. Um, but what is the value that you're offering your, your customers? So then when COVID hit, everyone had to stop for a minute and think about what they were doing in business. And then this big word pivot kept coming to business owners. You need to pivot, you need to pivot. And one way that you can pivot is by offering a different value proposition. Same product, same service, but a different value. So you enhance the value without changing your whole operation. So you will you saw co companies offering uh, or changing their messaging to include terms like contactless or clean or virtual, online, delivery, remote, at home, care, wellness. All of these words were um, buzzwords that resonated with the customer who wanted to feel safe. So for companies that were not delivering this message, it made customers leery about working with them and doing business. So same product, same service, we're just going to change our message, change the value that we are offering so that customers know that we are caring about their safety because safety is now top of mind and of importance and the uh, greatest need for customers. So as you're developing your value proposition, think about what your customers need. There may be some things that you just want to offer them, um, but if they don't need it, they're less likely to buy, buy from you. So think about what they need and what value you can offer to satisfy that need. So here's some examples. I'm using Slack and Digit. So Slack is a online uh, platform to help uh, people communicate, uh, whether it's uh, teams or associations or work or other outside groups or what have you. Their value proposition is um, that their platform makes users, users will be their customers, makes users working lives more simple, productive, and easier. So that's what you can get from using uh, Slack uh, to be productive, to make work easier and to make it simple. The next example is Digit. So Digit is a um, online platform that allows you to uh, manage your savings or build your savings. And so their value proposition is offering hands-off savings. So we're gonna come back to these um, uh, two companies. So keep Slack and Digit in, in mind as we are developing me messages for our companies. So now we're going to move on to identifying your real customers. Who wants your value? Who are the people or groups of people or associations or companies that want the value that you are offering? So uh, when you think about your value proposition, for whom are you creating value? Who wants what you are offering? And then you may have a long list of people who may want that offering. You want to think about who are the most important customers or 
where it can get the most money from, or um, who are the groups of people that are most likely willing and able to buy this particular value that you're offering. If you have a long list and you can't make a decision as to who is most important, then you want to um, identify common characteristics among those groups to help simplify that customer, that customer segment. When companies first get started, I don't recommend them to have multiple customer segments because each customer segment requires a different marketing strategy, a different message, maybe different operational processes in managing those customers, which is all money. So as we are um, on the smaller end, uh, if we have a small team, we want to focus on one or two customers. Uh, Uber has two customers. It's the drivers and the users. And they're a multi-billion dollar uh, company. So it's okay to have one or two customers. You don't have to have six or seven or eight or more than that. One or two. So that we can further define what our marketing message is and what our strategy is and to manage our costs. All right, so ways that you can segment customers, you can segment them uh, using demographics or psychographics. So demographics are um, based on population characteristics, things that you can see and tell, gender, race, age, income, where you live, what, where you work, what kind of job you have. Psychographics, these are, you can't really tell these, uh, you can't really identify psychographics without asking questions and things like that. So psychographics are lifestyle characteristics, uh, the way customers behave, uh, their traits, their lifestyles, where they hang out, what they think about, what their mindsets are, what their motivations are, their functionality, what, um, how they um, conduct themselves in their homes or how they conduct themselves at work. So the way that you figure out some of these psychographics, especially for your customers, would have to uh, be um, uh, focus groups or surveys or just asking them some of these questions that are most important to you. So these are ways you can segment your customers. They do not have to be um, all of these. You can have more than one uh, characteristic that you're looking at, and that's fine too. But the idea is to simplify your customer segments so that you have one or two. All right, so now we're getting into crafting our message. We know what our value is. We know who wants the value. Now we got to talk to them. We got to talk to those customers who want our value. Craft your message using your value proposition. So you want to tell them what and how things will be better. After using your offering, how will things be better for the customer? As a result of purchasing our offering, you will, and then you fill in the blank. When I say you, I'm referring to customers. Uh, tell them what they will get as a result. So don't tell them what it is, uh, the product, what the product or service is. Tell them what they will get as a result of using that product or that service. Does that make sense? If you have questions, because we're going to come to a Q&A segment here uh, pretty soon. If you have questions, I want you to put the question in the chat. Uh, if you're like most of us, you'll have a question and then when it's Q&A time, you forget what that question is. So put the question in the chat now or as you are, uh, as they come to mind so that we can address them in the Q&A segment. So I wanna go back. I wanna go back to Slack and I wanna go back to Digit. So the value proposition for Slack was to make users working lives more simple, productive and easier. The message now for Slack is to be more productive at work with less effort. This is what you tell your customers. You can, as a result of using, going back to this statement, as a result of purchasing our offering, what it is that we're offering, you will be more productive at work with less effort. So you're not telling, you're not telling us what it is uh, that the product, you're not saying what the product is initially. You are explaining the value. 
go down to digits. The value proposition, offering hands-off savings. Message, save money without thinking about it. So as a result of purchasing our offering, you will save money without thinking about it. Hopefully this is making sense to you and you're thinking about your company. What value am I offering? Who wants that value or who can pay for it? <laughs> That's more important. Who can pay for this value? And then what is my message going to be? Let me give some other um, examples of um, value propositions of companies. They had one value and then COVID hit and then they had a switch. So Snack Nation. Snack Nation is a company that offers snacks to companies, to larger corporations that has multiple employees. Um, they, the companies purchase the snacks in bulk and then the employees can have at the snacks during the day keep up productivity, engagement, things like that. Well, COVID hit and all of the employees went home. So then Snack Nation said, what are we gonna do? Companies are not ordering snacks because most of the employees are working from home. So they had to change, pivot their value proposition and they added that keyword in there. So now they are delivering, how can we provide snacks to companies whose employees are working from home. They started sending the snacks to the employees at home and the company still paid for it. So they said to the companies, hey, you can still, ex your employees can still experience these good tasting snacks. You pay us for the snacks in bulk and we will deliver the snacks to the employees' homes. So it'll feel like they are still in their work environment and they can enjoy this, their snacks like they did in uh, before in meetings. The meetings just might be remote, but we're all eating snacks together. Uh, so they just made that simple change to their value proposition. Instead of snacks at work, you're now getting snacks at home to create the perfect remote experience for your team. So in this case, the company is still the customer. Even though the snacks are for the employees, the employees are not paying for them, therefore they are not the customers. Customers are people who pay you. Customers are people who pay you. So for Snack Nation, uh, all they had to do was to send the snacks to the employees' homes. Let's look at another example. Club Vino. Club Vino was known for wine tastings, like here in Columbus, Cooper Talk. People like to go to Cooper Talk for wine tastings. COVID hit, we don't get to go, we don't get to have any wine tastings. So what Club Vino decided to do was shift their value and still offer wine tastings but package them in a way that they can ship to their customers' homes and they can enjoy wine tasting experiences at home. Same product, same service, different value. I'd like to open up the floor for questions now. If you have questions, go ahead and post them in the chat. Diona, it seems like our audience may be a little shy, so I'm okay. going to ask a few questions because I trust and believe Janine Hooks is taking notes. Okay. <laughs> um, I love when you said customers are people who pay you. That is so important because it's succinct and it really drives that message home. Tell me what your thoughts are if we discount creating a value proposition. What's the consequences of that? What, what would you say? You will, uh, people won't buy. If you do not um, establish your value proposition and you can't communicate it, then they're not going to understand why they should buy from you. They're not going to understand what would be the purpose of buying from your company. If you cannot articulate, communicate the value, because then you leave it up to the customer to figure out what it actually is and how it would benefit them. And if they don't know enough about your product or service, 
they can't make that uh, analysis in their mind because they don't they don't know enough. Very good point. And I would say that since we all had to shelter in place, we were exposed to so much more marketing content across mm -hmm. TV, social media. You know, so it's like it almost becomes white noise. So how do you stand out from the crowd? I think that's kind of what you're getting at as well. Absolutely. Um, yes. So tell us a little bit about, okay, so we know we need to refresh the message, right? Mm -hmm. um, make sure we're targeting our audience to people that are actually paying for our product or service. What's the frequency that I need to be at in terms of blasting this out to people? What's your experience? As many as many times as you can, uh, when you actually, I have, was that the next slide? Let me go to the next slide. Delivering your message. Where do you deliver this message? And then I'm gonna get to how often. So this message that you should create, that you create should be on all of your communications. So every time a customer hits your company, they are receiving the same message. Even if you have employees, the employees need to know what the message is so that they are delivering the same me message as well. So you can put this message on your website, on your homepage, the first place people go to, um, your email signature. So when you send out emails, you can have that message right there um, on your email signature, ending every email. It's okay if it's every email because everybody doesn't read the email signature the first time. Uh, your business card should have your message on there. What is the value of working with you? Your social media on your banner, on your, uh, your business page banner. Um, some of the content that you create in your social media should uh, reiterate and reinforce your message, your promotional flyers. So let's say you're offering a certain, certain product, but somewhere um, on there should be your company message what you what you are always going to offer um, as a company, that overall company value. Uh, interviews and introductions. So even in spaces like this, I know we're virtual, uh, but um, when you have online meetings, you should be prepared to introduce yourself and explain what, uh, and, and state your message. In interviews, if you are interviewed for a news article or um, a podcast, you should be ready with your message. As frequently as you can share your message. In your mind, you may think this is excessive, but you touch so many people in a day, in a week, in a month, in a year that you don't know wh who's receiving that message. I had that challenge. Like, I don't need to say this every time, uh, but it helps re reinforce who you are as a company and what you are trying to deliver to your customers. So it may sound excessive and that's only because you're saying it and you're reading it over and over and over. Um, but the more that you say it and the more that you read it uh, for yourself, you believe more in your value and your confidence builds because you see your value being delivered. Um, confidence is also key in business. If you are able to, uh, demonstrate your confidence in something, uh, people buy into confidence as well. If you've ever experienced a salesperson fumble through their paperwork and their, uh, their script and things, you're like, ah, you don't really know what you're talking about. Um, so the more confident that you are in your company and in your value, that will also increase attractiveness to your, or um, appeal to your, your message or your company. So I had in an interactive workshop, on a live workshop, I would have um, attendees to uh, write their value proposition, create their message, and then share it and see if we understand um, as your peers, if we understand what you offer and what, what, what you do. If you are able to, we want you to go ahead and write your, your message in the chat. As a result of your offering, your customers will what? If you are able to share your message, we would love to, uh, we would love to hear it. 
Any other questions? I think this, uh, this is Janine again, this mm -hmm. ties in so neatly with our previous webinar. We were talking about um, the points of being a salesperson mm -hmm. um, because so many times entrepreneurs are um, shy about selling or they don't want to identify themselves as a salesperson because for some reason that has a negative connotation. So when you talk about confidence sells, mm -hmm. you're absolutely spot on with that because um, you need to know your business and you would be the best possible representative of that business. So having that message ready to go on all these collateral pieces you've talked about, especially business cards is so very critical. So um, I just love the way that, you know, when a plan comes together and we're able to tie everything up with a nice, neat bow. I also encourage people to share their value proposition um, for their business. But I'm going to ask you, will you share yours for Aventi Enterprises? Absolutely. So when I introduced our, ourselves, and I didn't do it today, I was, um, it's a little uh, distracted. But uh, generally, when I introduce Aventi, I say, um, uh, we are a small business consulting firm transforming entrepreneurs into high growth CEOs. And we do that by way of business planning and strategy preparation for financing and government contracting. So that's generally how I introduce myself. And it's not long. It's not, you know, drawn out. Um, it's just what my team member says, clear, concise, and direct CCD. So transforming, high, uh, transforming entrepreneurs into high growth CEOs. Okay, so let's break this down. We have, um, usually you would see it, it, at MBAC, we talk about value proposition in context with business planning. Yes. Right, yes. So um, I've got my mission statement, my vision statement, and my value proposition. Can you talk to me about the nuances and the differences between each one for those of us that might need to go back and retool that a little bit? Sure. So. Your vision statement is where you want to, what you want to see happen in the future as a result of being in business. So your, your vision is something that is far reaching and we never know if it'll actually be achieved. Uh, so like even in the nonprofit space, when we have our vision statement, uh, a great example of um, uh, a vision is uh, the end of seeing the end of world hunger. That is a far reaching goal, something that we want to see, but we are going to work toward it, whether it, it, if we can accomplish that or not, we're going to work toward it. That's what we would like to see. It's going to cause a lot. Um, uh, it's going to require a lot of work and dedication to get this far reaching vision to reach this far far-reaching vision. Uh, your mission statement is how you're going to go about uh, uh, accomplishing that vision or seeing that vision to fruition. What are you going to do? How, like, how are you going to get that done? And the value proposition is to your customers explaining what value you deliver to them as a result of doing business with you which is helping you accomplish your mission, which is helping you uh, realize your vision. I love it. You just are able to, you make the hard things seem easy, but we both know <laughs> that it takes some time to get it does. As it you does. coach businesses, you know, through kind of this process, what's the expectation on timeline? Well, I mean, what do you kind of put in front of them on, you know, do this by when to get such and such? It really depends on what your business goals are. Some, some timelines are different. Everyone's timeline is not going to be the same. And depending on what it is that you're, you're doing in business, let's say you have a, uh, uh, what we call a visionary venture in our uh, entrepreneur assessment class. A visionary venture is a uh, company that takes a while to build. Maybe you're trying to create some technology technology product or what have you. And it's going to require a lot of time, a lot of investment. So that could, 
that could be a year or two before it even launches. So your timeline looks a little bit different than the solopreneur who can just open up the computer and start working and making money immediately. Uh, so timelines are different depending on what your vision is, would uh, change your timeline as well. Uh, I know our team went through uh, a strategic planning process and we had to go through vision and mission. And as simple as I just explained it, it took us months to really hone down what we were trying to do within this company and how we were gonna go about doing it. Like it was a lot of discussion. Uh, we had to do a lot of research just to nail down vision and mission. And we couldn't go beyond that. We could not build anything else out in that plan without securing that vision and mission. And then the value proposition did come in, but that vision and mission took some time and it doesn't have to take as long as it took us. Um, but as you do grow your team, and more ideas start coming out and more products and services are developed. Um, it's easy to uh, creep away from your vision and your mission. And so having that written down keeps you focused. And that's what we say about the business planning process, which is a little different than the strategic planning process, but um, that business plan is there to keep you focused so that you don't veer off. When you veer off, you end up spending a lot more money than you wanted to uh, because you're not in your sole purpose. You didn't uh, structure your business to offer these veer offs uh, that you are experiencing. So that business plan is really helpful in staying focused so that you can accomplish what it is that you say that you want to accomplish. You are like in my head right now. <laughs> One of the things that, you know, in coaching sessions, because I believe very strongly in the power of a business plan and committing time to that, because I, I share with my clients that it's your true north. It's the compass it that keeps you on track because there will be attractive distractions that show up that have big dollar signs. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, you're off chasing money and you're so far away from your vision and mission. You're not sure what your identity is as an entrepreneur and as a business owner. So yes. we are aligned in that. Um, when you are working with uh, entrepreneurs and you know, a, a business plan can look like a lean one page document to almost look like a thesis, depending on um, the intensity of the business owner. But how often do you think those messages from a business planning standpoint should be updated or refreshed? Um, either annually or whenever you change something, you need to go back to your business plan and see how that fits. Um, I suggest if you are thinking about planning something, go to your business plan first before you make the decision to change or to add to your company. And that'll help you make the decision whether that should happen or not. So um, um, if you're, if you don't plan on changing anything for the year, just make it a habit at uh, some point each year, same point in the year that you review your business plan and see if you're on track. And then you can identify if you did make some changes, why you made those changes. Are those changes strategic enough for you to keep doing them? Um, do you need to uh, stop doing something? Uh, so that uh, annual review is a good time and or whenever you decide to make a, a big change in business. That's when you should review your business plan, your value proposition, and your business model. So I, I did want to share how uh, this value proposition fits within the business model. We teach a business model design class, and we always start with, with value propositions because value propositions are the core of everything in business, how your company operates and makes money, we have to start with value proposition. So when you design a value proposition, then you have to figure out who wants that value. That's your customer segment. Then you have to figure out how you're going to deliver that value proposition to your customers. That's channels. Then you're going to figure out how you interact with your customers to deliver that value. That's customer relationships. And then you look at your revenue streams. What are the cash categories or sales categories that you can get from your customers as a result of them buying into your value proposition? Everything on the right-hand side of this canvas is directly related to customers, which helps you build your marketing strategy. And then on the left-hand side of that canvas is our operations uh, 
your key activities. What are the most important activities that have to be performed to deliver that value that you set? What are the key resources, things you need to have in order to deliver that value? Who are the key partners, the external uh, organizations or people that you need to work with to help you deliver the value? And then what's the cost structure, the most important cost you're going to incur to deliver that value? So the value proposition is the heart of everything that you do. And you should really be starting there. Once you define and uh, establish your value proposition and you start communicating it, to your um, prospective customers, you will realize how much easier it is to sell something. So I just wanted to give a, a, um, an overview of business model and how that plays a role in, um, or how value proposition plays a role in the development of your model. Your model is how you operate and make money or big picture, not details. This is big picture, how you're um, uh, business is supposed to operate and make money and create value for customers. And then the business plan explains how you do that in detail. And I can see how committing yourself to this exercise and going through the rigor of this would make you a much more competent and confident business owner. You can defend any of your activities, um, how, why you're pricing your items or your services the way that you do because you can always tie that back to value proposition. Yes. So friends, I, I know you guys are shy. Maybe it's a little early in the day. Maybe you got hump day itis, I don't know. But this content is so awesome. And I just love the fact that you're breaking it down and you're making the hard things simple, but um, it's important. It is important that we commit ourselves to these exercises. Um, share more, I'm gonna be quiet while you go ahead and take us further into this content, Diona. Well, what I, I don't want to do is give too much information because I really want you to think about um, what your offering truly means to customers. What you may find is that you are offering something to the wrong people, meaning they're not your true customer. They're not the ones that are going to buy it. Uh, a great example of that is uh, a daycare center. You serve kids but you're not selling to kids, you're selling to the parents. And so what is important for the parents for them to buy from you so that they can leave their kids with you? Um, nonprofits, another great example. They, uh, nonprofits uh, generally serve a group of people at no cost and they are getting receiving funding or donations or grants or what have you to do to deliver that um service in that case the people that you're serving those are beneficiaries and they and if they don't pay you for a service they're not your true customers they're beneficiaries so your donors and your grantors those are your true customers because they're the ones that have your money so you need to figure out what is the value that you are offering to those sets of people so that they will give you the money. And then you can provide the service to your beneficiary. Now you can create a separate value proposition to your beneficiaries, but the overarching business model says, here are the customers that we are going to uh, go after for them to give us money. Customers are people who give you money. Beneficiaries are groups of people who, who can receive your service and maybe not at no cost, but who has your money? These are your true customers. And I want to uh, drive that point home because if you are creating a value proposition, you need to make sure it speaks to the people who are going to pay you, not for the people you, you want to serve. So if there is a group of people that you want to serve, but they don't really have the money to pay you, then you either need to uh, change your customer. Well, that's number one, I change the customer or change what you are offering. So it fits the current customer that you have who can then afford what it is that you're offering. So if there is, there's some things that you're offering and your customers cannot afford it, it's either the wrong product or it's the wrong customer. So let's not get upset with our customers when they can't and choose not to buy from us. Uh, we need to look at ourselves as a company. What is the value that I'm offering? Does it relate to that customer? Do they need it? 
are they able to buy it? And if they are not able to buy it, if you hear a lot of complaints about how expensive it is and things like that, then you may need to change your product for that customer if that's who you really want to serve or you really want uh, to uh, have them buy from you or change your customer and offer the same thing at the same price to a different set of customers. So that's that's what I want to leave uh, with the group today is really thinking about what am I offering and am I offering it to the right customer? What am I offering value? And am I offering it to the right customer? Do they want it? Can they buy it? Do they need it? Do they want it? Can they buy it? Do they need it? And then develop your message from there. So you may have to do some research before you actually get to the, the crafting message part. Value proposition, who's the customer that wants it? Do some research. Uh, what you could do is, I'm gonna stop sharing this for a minute. Um, what you could do is, uh, well, I don't even know how to stop. Yeah, no. Okay. What you could do is ask if you already have a customer base. You can ask um, if you speak with them on the phone, if you do one on one meetings with them, just ask. Ask what it is that they're looking for. What do they need? Um, focus groups, surveys. Start doing some market research to really understand who your true customer is. If you experience decline in sales during COVID, find out what the needs of your customers are now, or do you need to make a shift to a different customer segment based on what you're offering? So uh, you're going to take some time to do some market research. I'm not expecting anyone to have a message at 11.49 a.m. today, uh, because that's going to take some time for you to really understand uh, more about your company, what value you're offering, and then to really understand your customers and what they, what they need and want. So thank you so much for having me today. I hope this was valuable and that it is something that you can start working on. If you have any questions, uh, you're welcome to contact me. Uh, now I do have my contact on the uh, PowerPoint. Let me uh, put that on there really quick. Uh, you are welcome to contact me. And here is my contact information, uh, Deanna at eventyenterprises.com. Uh, we also have um, opportunities for you to schedule appointments on our website at www.eventyenterprises.com. We are also on Facebook. Just search eventyenterprises.com and uh, LinkedIn as well. Same thing, eventyenterprises.com. And if you don't remember anything else, uh, you'll remember Aventi Enterprises. <laughs> so thank you so much for having me. And I hope that uh, you can start crafting your message. Deanna, you brought the fire today. Really, you know, I've always said that um, when you are exposed to knowledge, you are accountable to it. And you have shared some things that I think all of us, whether we're business owners or we're thinking about getting into business or we're seasoned and mature, um, you've reminded us that it's so important to refresh these messages mm -hmm. that, you know, it is important to, you know, serve your passion best by preparing and planning and thinking deeply about these things. So you are putting your best foot forward in the marketplace. So I encourage everyone that's on this webinar to, you know, take her up on the challenge, you know, share your value proposition. You've got her email there. You also have the contact information for Inback. So you feel free to, you know, email us if you want to, if you're a little intimidated by the brilliance of Deanna, you know, you can work oh, with us me. as well. <laughs> Um, but yeah, share your message. You're, you're not going to grow unless you, you know, tap into some of the other resources and partners that are out here in the community. So again, I thank you so very much, Aventi Enterprises, for sharing your talent and expertise with us on today. And I look forward to partnering with you further in the future. Everyone, thank you again for showing up and being present uh, for another uh, Columbus Urban League in back edition of our learning and education programming. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. You get nine minutes back of your time, make the most of it. And we look forward to seeing you on our next event. Thanks again, all. Bye.